thank you for the opportunity to be able to speak with you. I want to tell everybody that's going to watch this on YouTube, thank you as well. What an exciting time. I've got so much to say and so little time. Listen, let me tell you something that happened to my life. And it was a, it was a crazy and amazing time in my life. I was born in 1966. In Chicago, where it, they were having the greatest freeze storm to date at that time. And my mother, who's from Italy, could only speak a few words of English. And as the days and the months drew and the storm continued, she began to run out of food. And so our time in this little prison was very scary. My mother began to take flour and sift it through a pillowcase to feed me. About two months later, we were released out of there because the storm uh, had passed. The freeze was opening up. And during the spring, we were able to get out. And what had happened to me was uh, some of you moms out there know what jaundice is. And I had a severe case of that. And so being underdeveloped and undernourished, I had a really big head and a big belly. So the only thing that hasn't changed yet is the big head. <laughs> but God has healed through time. And when I first wrote my testimony, it was like 15, 18 pages. It's, it's huge. So what I'm going to try to do is adapt this story for you and to come across how God is so powerful. My parents uh, were having trouble in marriage. My father had spent several uh, tours in Vietnam, and uh, the effects of Vietnam really destroyed him. And he had such a very hard time communicating. His communication was out of anger and out of frustration. And not being able to communicate with my mother, that, uh, that made it a lot harder. So he would communicate with his hands. And he would slap her around and uh, become very violent. Uh, after some time, my mother had uh, decided that she had to pull herself out of that situation, and she left us kids with my father. Having had that, he uh, did not know how to communicate with three kids that were really rambunctious and kind of crazy, and we witnessed his anger. We witnessed how he would slap my mother around, and as time had gone on, uh, if we didn't eat fast enough, you'd get slapped off the table. So a lot, of, a lot of damage had happened already, and we were very, very young. We're talking about three and a half, four years old. My father finally decided, you know what, I can't do this anymore. So he began to seek foster care. And so we went from foster care to foster care to foster care. And in, in these foster cares, there was one that was really wonderful, and her name was Mama Brooks. And she was a very, very large black woman and so full of love. And I would come running home, I'd get beat up at school, come running home crying, and she'd say, come here, boys, come here, and she'd give me a really big hug. And one time she hugged me, and I was squirming. I was squirming because, see, I couldn't breathe. <laughs> she had me all up in her, and I was squirming, squirming, the harder I squirmed, the harder she squeezed. <laughs> and so I, I think maybe I had passed out for a minute. And, and she released me, and I, uh, you know, recovered and regained from that. But I got to tell you, uh, for the next, like, five months, I slept between two of my brothers, Clarence and uh, Tyrone. And Clarence and Tyrone were um, beautiful young boys who protected me now. So when I'd go to school, they would fight my battles for me. Finally, my father had gotten orders again. So he pulled us out of that home, which grieved me dearly. Uh, it was a really big hurt in my life. And um, he found another permanent place, unbeknownst to us. So we ended up driving north of Chicago into Wisconsin. And when we arrived on this 
huge farm. There are cows everywhere. There are bales of hay everywhere. There were chickens running around. There were uh, hound dogs laying on the, uh, the porch. And it was an entirely different environment than what we were used to. And so we uh, try to get used to that just right off the bat. But I remember standing in the, or, or playing in the, uh, the sandbox. And as I was playing in the sandbox, my father was running back and forth to his car. And I felt the gumption of the Lord. I know it now. It takes lots of years for you to put all the pictures, right, of your life in the album. And I realized then uh, that was God's voice saying, look up. That'll be the last time you ever see your father. And so when I looked up, the sun had hit me like this light was hitting me. And I just barely got a glance of him as he passed by. And his eyes slightly caught mine. But when he looked at me, I realized I was a stranger to him. And I knew at that moment, sitting in that sandbox, the Spirit of God was talking to me already about what you're going to have to do and what you're going to have to endure. I didn't know it specifically, but it was, you now are in charge. So I'm like six years old, and we're in this foster care family. They had five kids. Four of them were teenagers. One was about my age, maybe a year older than I was. As time had passed on, atrocities had occurred. Sexual abuse had occurred. Physical abuse had occurred. Mental abuse had occurred. And what seemed to only have to be like a month turned out to be years and years and years. And during school, I had a really big stuttering problem. And I, I, I couldn't get the words to my mouth. When I get very nervous, I do that even today. Being up here is not easy. Overcoming is not easy, but it's by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. By his blood. So as I learned in my life to begin to depend on him, I found that the state of Wisconsin had uh, did battery tests on us because I had some a lot of dysfunctions. I couldn't speak. I couldn't follow directions. Uh, I was severely abused, along with my sister and my little brother. I have a certificate at home that says from the state of Wisconsin that I'm mentally retarded. I am certified. We don't believe that, do we? No, not at all. No, amen. So, so having that, that was a license for me to do one of two things. I could decide there in my life, that's who I am. I could have decided at that moment that that defined Adam Childress. That right there could have told me I could have become a criminal for the rest of my life. And that I could be a hater. That I could be ugly. As time went on, I realized that music had seemed to be one of my um, greatest passions. And so I attended church because it just made me feel amazing. I want to tell you something about the abuse. That in the course of that, in the evening times, I would be visited by an angel. And that angel, I now know it was Jesus Christ. And when I asked him, who are you? He said, I am here for you. And it must have been what I had needed in my heart, the name, I am here for you. How many of you know that Jesus is here for you? Yeah. Right? In a very powerful and awesome way. I found in my life, in trying to overcome my stutter, trying to overcome taking tests, trying to overcome speaking publicly, trying to overcome the, the very dangerous things that had happened to me, I had to press into God. One day I came in from school, we're still on the farm, and there was this huge box sitting in the living room, and on that box was Italian writing, and I knew right away when I saw that, I thought, oh, hallelujah, my mind, something is going to happen. I read the information because nobody else could, and it was from my grandma and my grandpa. Unbeknownst to myself, my grandfather, who is in Italy, started what they call a congressional 
investigation in the military. It took them three years to find my dad, who was highly embedded in an espionage um, situation in a third world country. And they finally got him, lined him up, and then told him, listen, we're going to uh, court-martial you if you don't provide us with this information where their location is. So he finally gave that information. He arbitrated it, and he fought them. It took another seven months for him to release that information. What was exciting about that box was that I knew that that was the box of what I consider liberation at the time. Those were not the words I spoke, but those are words I remember. I knew it was only a matter of time until something was going to happen that I, we were going to get pulled out of that place. Months went by, and one uh, afternoon when I got off of school, I come into uh, the living room, and there was this lady, very, very beautiful, long hair, and she, it was kind of veiled. I couldn't see her well, and I think it was because I was in super shock. She calls out my name, Adamo, in Italian. Veni qua chi uno momento si era di per favore. She says to me in Italian, those words crush my soul. How many thousands of hours did I want to hear my mommy's voice? And it crushed me to the core. I remember walking up to her, and as I walked up to her, I just fell forward on her lap, bam, and just began to sob so deeply, letting out all of this, this pain and sorrow. And she rubbed on my back and she spoke in Italian to me. What a comforting moment that was for me. But next thing you know, I snapped back up. Pow! What are you doing here, I said. She said, well, she said, I'm going to come and pick you and your sister and your brother up. And we're going to leave this place. Whew. I was really excited about that. And I thought, man, I'm leaving. I ran upstairs. I packed my bag. I come back down with my bag. I'm ready. Oh, no, I got to come back. Mm. So seven months later, seven. So you know what happened. Lots more abuse because they knew I was leaving and my sister and my brother. By the time my mother showed up, she was with her new husband, and we loaded up into the car, and we took everything that we had had. All of the beautiful things that were in that box, you're probably wondering what that was. My grandfather sent watches, rings, necklaces, shirts, clothes, shoes. He wanted us to know, listen, you are loved, and this wasn't us who left you there. That was, that was very powerful uh, for all of us. As, as we left with my parents and went to um, Missouri, on, on the way, our first meal together, I remember it was McDonald's, and we were by the pool. And as we, we began to eat, my brothers and sisters grabbed the food and pulled it very close to us. And we were hiding it and eating it with our hands. And I could see the face on my mother and my new dad. They were like repulsed, number one. But they, were just, they just couldn't believe what has happened to these children. And we knew that, see, we were trained. If you don't eat and you don't eat fast and you don't, you don't cover your food, it's gone. And there were nights where we would starve because we didn't get to the table fast enough. And it would go very quickly. It showed the state of mind in which we were, as well as my new father trying to speak to me and trying to communicate uh, in some way. Come to find out, he was not equipped to speak to us kids. He was, I don't think anybody was really equipped to speak to the kids that were in front of him just to say that. But for him to uh, begin rejecting us because he could not communicate with us, he could not get us to do anything, you know, we were just busted up mentally. Things became uh, very difficult. And uh, through the next couple of years, I'm just going to try and uh, speed up a little bit. In the next couple of years, 
we ended up in the Missouri. And uh, in growing up and going to school, I ended up having to uh, go to these uh, special ed classes. You guys are familiar with that. Those were probably the best things for me because they actually taught me English. And so as I began to learn English, I began to understand I'm not the dummy that I am, that people say I am. And I realized that I'm much smarter, although there are, there are some very deep things in my life I can press through to this. I'm going to fast forward you into um, high school. In high school, I realized um, that music was a passion of mine. And so I took music for the next four years. But during music, I also wrestled in high school and played football, and I excelled heavily. And so uh, I went from the freshman team to the senior varsity team in the first year. And uh, I realized, wow, I do have a talent. This is awesome, and I'm getting stronger, and I'm working out, and I'm running, and I ran like the wind. Running gave me a release. It built me up. It gave me some freedom. And plus, I was able to talk to the Lord at the same time. I don't want to mix up the fact that I wasn't a full believer. I want you to know that. I knew about who this God was, and he had already been in my life. And he had already been speaking to me, but yet I had not surrendered that. But I still knew I had a friend anytime I wanted to call upon him. In my 11th year of high school, I was... um, Asked to try out for a full-ride scholarship to UNLV for music. And so I did. And when I started out, my, my teacher uh, began to train me. She took a personal interest in me, which I was, I'm praising God for that. She uh, would put all of the music that I needed to hear and learn on uh, cassette tapes. And I would play them over and over. And I must have played them at least a thousand times. You can have talent. But talent has to be mixed with skill. So if the talent and the skill are disconnected, it's kind of like an empty gun. Does that make sense? A car without gas. Battery without power. And I realized that I needed to have that skill set. And repetition was the key for me. I didn't know it at the time. In the background, while all of this was happening, I had started three businesses. One, I was delivering papers uh, during the morning time. Afternoons, I was mowing lawns. And in the evening time, or weekends, I was washing cars. And all of that was to build me up and to build my confidence. I was good at it. And I realized, man, this is what I want to do. I just want to work. So I moved out of my house. And so I, I was uh, 16, 16 and a half at the time. I believe it was 11th grade going into to senior year, and I was homeless. So I decided in the summertime, I, I uh, rolled out to, uh, actually that was my senior year, I rolled out to Pahrump. And at Pahrump, I was homeless, entertaining at night, and got involved in another business, phone rooms. Not proud of it. So we call people up, tell them they want a prize. It just wasn't a good deal. <laughs> I'm a salesman to heart, right? I can, I can sell you anything. And, and knowing that, I realized, that, wow, I can be really good at this. And so I became partners. So at now, now I'm 17 or 18. I'm a partner of a business. I'm making a lot of dough, a lot of cash. And as I get mixed up a little bit deeper into this, I'm starting to make decisions within this company. And the crew that I'm working for are a bunch of criminals, all ex-cons. So one day I come, um, I come home, and in the living room, there's the whole crew. The whole gang is in there. They're eerie silent, and they're all looking at me. And I'm thinking, what are you doing? What's going on? We, had, we got some questions for you. Okay, that's fine. What's happening? Well, we want to know uh, who gave out information about the company to our Vegas connection. Well, that wasn't me. Well, we think it was you. You're the only one that has Vegas ties. 
And I said, well, uh, they said, well, where were you Saturday? I said, well, I was in the backyard shadow boxing with Mike. And Mike was a big guy. And I look over at Mike. Mike's got a broken nose and some, uh, some black eyes. There's my evidence. So I said, hey, Mike, you remember Saturday. I got too close and I locked you up. And, and he, and he, he kind of denying like this. And his, his girlfriend pops up and says, no, no, we were in Vegas. And we got drunk and I pushed him down the staircase. He hit his face on the bottom pole. All the eyes switch back to me. So I'm now in stutter mode. I'm now frightened beyond belief. Next thing that happens is my partner pulls out a gun from out from underneath the pillow where he was sitting and points it at me. Okay, so now all life has left me. I'm in complete freeze mode. Uh, 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 we want answers and we want them now. I don't have any answers. I told him, I don't have any answers. Oh, you got answers. Go outside. So all of us go outside, get in the truck. Well, I don't want to get in the truck. One of the guys pushed me. You're going to get in the truck. Okay, I'm going to get in the truck. So I get in the truck. They're screaming at me, and they're driving off and crazy. I'm frightened beyond my mind. In the chair, one of them strikes me. Another one kicks me. They're yelling things at me. You're a liar. You're, 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 you've done this, and you told this information. Now you're going to pay. So we're flying down the desert. About an hour and a half into it, two hours, we end up in a deep, deep area in Pahrump. So mind you, it's 25 years, 30 years ago. So it's very barren out there. Get out of the truck. I don't want to get out of the truck. They push me out of the truck. Boom. Go that way. I don't want to go that way. Go that way. One of the guys pulls my arm, pulls me over, and kicks me. Pow! Oh, that hurt. I'm trying to walk away, and I am frightened. Tears are rolling down my face, and I'm wondering how, how am I going to get out of this? Oh. And I'm walking, and I'm walking, and I hear the ricochet of the gun. And I know next is the bullet. I'm maybe about from here to that door over there. And I am looking up at the stars, and it was pitch dark, and, but so very beautiful. And I knew at that moment, tears coming down on my, my face. And the night goes very silent. What I didn't know was something had happened. I'm crying my heart out, and I dropped to my knees, God! Oh, God! If you're real, you, you can save me. You can take me from this moment. Help me, God. Help me, God. Tears falling. Quiet. And all I hear is the door slamming. <laughs> Truck tires. Brah. And I'm coming to my senses. What is this? What's happening? And as I lean over to look, all I see are the brake lights and a bunch of dust happening. Oh, God. Oh, God. Wow. God, you did it. You did it. You did it. Yay. Hallelujah. I start running towards the mountain. Whoop, 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 whoop. And I'm running. I'm running. I'm running. I'm probably 30 seconds into it. You're going the wrong way. Whoop. <laughs> I don't care. I don't care. I'm out. I'm out of here. So I run about another 10 minutes towards the mountain, and I'm thinking, no, no, no. Turn around. Turn around. They're gone. They're not coming back. Oh, run towards it. I'm looking for, for lights or something, and I see lights off in the distance way out here. So I start running that way. It took me two and a half days to get back into town. Two and a half days. And in those two and a half days was a firm conversion. I was so excited about my new life, that God had 
torn all of this pain from me, rescued me from getting shot, strengthened me to get back to safety, and then to find my life in Him. Amen. Hallelujah. Go ahead and give Him glory. Amen. Hallelujah. He rescued me when nothing else could. They were determined to kill me. They were determined to take me out. But God had other plans. It's interesting, right? When you get to that lowest point, God rescues. Because, see, he knew I was, in, in, I was postured at that moment. I was truly ready to surrender my life to him. See, he didn't want my past to get in my way. He didn't want that abuse to get in the way. And he certainly didn't want that abandonment to get in my way. He wanted to use me in a very awesome and powerful way. By the time I got back to Vegas, which is about a month later, I had uh, gotten a hold of the only Christian I ever met. And it was one of my best friends in high school. So I called him up. He immediately came and picked me up. He immediately called some of his friends, and they put me in their house. And there, I stayed for about another month, and UNLV called me and said, listen, we need to get you registered for your um, scholarship. But I knew all that time as I was spending in the Word of God, that was just not my destiny anymore. God had something different for me. I wanted to have adventure. I wanted to travel but I wanted to know the God I was serving now. And the only way to do that was to let that scholarship go and join the military. And so I joined the military, and my life changed forever. I don't have enough time to get to the full story, but I got to tell you, when I joined the military, it changed who I was and my character. Every morning I spent three and a half hours in God's Word I would wake up at 4 a.m., have to be at work at 8. And I would spend that time with God. And He began to heal me. He began to transform me. I began to speak to my soldiers. I was able to uh, lead them in such a way that it impacted their life. When I went to boot camp, there were 42 young men that were with me. And out of those 42, 32 of them gave their lives to Christ. Amen? Huge moment. Huge moment for Jesus Christ in heaven. In, in this, I, I want to conclude. I think we've got some, um, some stuff we want to put up on the, on the monitor. I want to talk about some of these changes that God had done in my life during the military. Listen, I had a crazy, awesome military career until I decided I needed to leave. Till God had called me somewhere else. Uh, I want to tell you some of the awesome things that God had used me in. I don't have time. That's going to be part two. For sure, right? But let's talk about, uh, in my conclusion, I've got about ten minutes. And I want to talk to you about seven principles. Design, authority, responsibility, suffering, ownership, freedom, and success. Those are the principles that I live my life by. Take a chance, write them down. As I surveyed the biblical horizon and all of its mysteries throughout my dangerous life, I noticed that all the answers to life's questions are in His Word. Right? When you're born, you do come with a manual. When your baby's born, it came with a manual. That manual is Emmanuel. Amen? His Word, His Holy Word teaches us every day. Who am I? We'll find out when you're reading in God's Word. So design, uh, number one. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You, your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Where? The depths of the earth. Your eyes saw 
my unformed body. Amen. Be encouraged. That See, you were designed to serve Him. You were designed to love Him. You were designed for Him. What's happened to you in your life is something that's developing you and shaping you. But He wants to use that bad for His good. Amen? Number two is authority. Everyone must sit, submit himself. To the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who give an account. Obey them so that their work will be joy, not a burden. For that would not be of any advantage to you. Amen. The principles of our lives, who we are, how we live, what we think. Well, I think that God said that I need to be under authority. So if I'm under authority, I need to do one thing. I need to obey. Amen. Number three is responsibility. Proverbs 28, 13. He who conceals his sin does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Ephesians 4.31 says, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawlings, and slander, along with every other malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ had forgiven you. What stops you? What stops you from forgiving? What stops you from excelling? See, the key word? Is forgiveness. You must forgive. And it allows you to grow. It allows you to mature. And it drops off the bitterness and the rage. It drops off all the excuses that you get to have. Because of what happened to you. Or, or the decisions that you made. Right? Because we made some bad decisions. Man. Do our decisions define us? His word does. See, the principles that live in your heart, that's what it does. Am I a number three? Four. Four, thank you. Suffering. This is powerful. Romans tells us that we must rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our suffering because suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. Hope does not disappoint because God has poured out his love to our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Suffering produces endurance. So when you're going through heavy things in your life, don't reject it. But I tell you, embrace it. Find the lesson. Find what God is trying to do in you. Find what is not of him. See, the Lord is constantly chiseling on you. Everything that's not him. That hurts, doesn't it? After a while, that chiseling gets a little close to the bones. It gets a little close to the heart. And then we have to, we have to endure that peace. And no one knows. It's a real deep isolation, isn't it? But he is good because he says what? Endure. Because that is my hope. Amen? Okay, and then number five. Ownership. I want to read it from here. I don't think I have it right. You will appear before Christ. I only hyphenated them. Provide for relatives or deny the faith. I love that part right there. And then Corinthians. Give up your childish ways. What does that mean? When you were young, you thought like a young person. But now that you are grown, you need to think like a grown person. Look at the equation. The math doesn't work. I'm grown, but I still think like I'm nine. I don't want to be responsible. I don't want to grow up. I don't want to be participating in life. But that's a lie from the devil. 
because you're a grown person now. You take responsibility because, see, the Lord God himself, he's groomed you. He's building you up. He's giving you success. Amen? Amen. My final, I have two more. Freedom. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Do you agree with that? Amen. Galatians 5.13, freedom to serve one another. 2 Corinthians 3.17, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Hallelujah. The freedom I experienced that one day, long ago in the desert, when I heard the ricochet of that gun. Suddenly I became in a bubble of freedom. I recognize now, after all of these years, that God had surrounded me just like that. And I had said to you, in that moment, it was silent. In that moment, honestly, I thought I was dead. I thought in that moment, I was going to feel the impact. Well, I did feel the impact. I felt the heavenly impact of a Savior and an awesome God. Amen? An awesome God. Finally, success. Proverbs 16, 3, commit your work to the Lord and your plans, and they will be well established. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. That's in Psalms 37, 4. And I think we have Proverbs as well. Where should you write it? You should write it on your heart because, see, that is where the Lord wants to live. Be a man and woman of principle. Align your life with the Savior, and His name is Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Listen, would you bow your head with me as I close? Can I get the uh, worship team up, if you don't mind? What I want to do is I want to talk to you about a moment and an opportunity. This might be your first time that you've heard a story like this. And this might be the first time you've been in our church. This may be the first time that God has opened your eyes. And I don't want to leave this moment without first putting our heart in check. And giving ourselves an opportunity to give ourselves to the King. So, Father, today, pray with me this. Lord, we ask you, Father, to come into our hearts. Father, we confess that we are sinners. God, I invite you to cleanse my heart and my mind and my soul of all the sins I have ever made or committed or ever will commit. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Lord, I surrender my life into your hands. In Jesus' mighty name.